Happy Resurrection Sunday. I am excited about Resurrection Sunday. And I'm really going to be excited when I take my last breath. You're going to be more excited then than you are right now, I promise. Because some of you, you look like knots on a log. I mean, this is Resurrection Sunday. My, my, my dad used to say, look like a cow looking at a new gate. Walk up to him, cock its head a little bit and say, what are we doing here? Well, this is Resurrection Sunday. I mean, this is, wow, this is it. This is like Christmas to a baby. This is the day. And I'm excited to share what God has laid on my heart for you today. And hallelujah, they have given me. Got to back up a little bit. That time, that clock there is kind of small. It's, it's 20 minutes till 11. Give me an hour and 20 minutes. Lord. Then I usually take 30 minutes after 12. So, man, I got an hour. No, I'm kidding. So glad you're here today. How many of you are first time visitors? Just stick your hand up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Over here. Got a whole row over here. Glory to God. Put your hand down. Amen. We're so glad you're here. Will you just give all of our visitors a great big hand clap? <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we'll have time to connect with you right after church and, and just, uh, just kind of get to know, at least to know your names that I'll forget in three minutes. Amen. I want to talk to us today because it is Resurrection Sunday, and I know that you've heard a million different stories. Different messages on the resurrection on Easter Sunday, and you've heard it preached every which way that you can preach it, but you hadn't heard it preached this way because this is the first time I've come up with it. So uh, you, may, uh, you may have heard similar to this, but it won't be this message, amen. But I want to talk to us today on the topic, what will you do with Christ? What will you do with Christ? Now, if I took a poll across this room and and uh, first, we'd have to define who Christ is to you. What does He mean to you? But after we established that individually, I could ask the question, well, what, what are you going to do with Christ? And we would have probably different answers based upon our circumstances, based upon our situation, or whatever might be going on. But the question still remains, what will you do with Christ? And I'm going to hopefully bring out some things this morning that will help us view what we should do with Christ a little differently. Now the crucifixion or the resurrection, ever how you want to say it, is found in all four Gospels. It's found in Matthew 27 and 28, Mark 15, uh, Luke 23, John 19 and 20. But I'm going to take my message this morning from Matthew chapter 27. And for the sake of time, not to take away from the Word of God, because if you come here very much, you know that I'm a, I'm a Word kind of guy. But you got to read the whole two chapters. I sent it to Hunter, uh, my son-in-law, the media guy back here, and he says, oh, Lord. He's scrolling. There's a lot of scriptures. Oh, Lord. I said, well, I left a lot of them out. So um, I'm going to jump down through 20, uh, chapter 27, and, and I'll, try to be, uh, I'll try to tell you what I'm going to do that. I'm going to read a few scriptures, and then I'll jump a few just for the sake of time, not to take away from the Word of God. Amen? You with me? But you will get the point all along. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 1 and verse 2, it says, When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put Him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, what is so unique about this situation is that one week earlier, just one week, this same crowd, these same people that were in the crowd saying crucify him were the same ones who were waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. That word Hosanna simply means one who saves, a deliverer. These same people were crying out, deliver us, save us, save us. They had put their hope in the right person. And a week later, one week later, they're calling for his crucifixion. He's before Pilate. He's being judged on something that he did not do saying that there was heresy in his life, that he was, he was portraying himself as someone that he was not. 
But yet we know today because we have the full gospel that he was exactly who he said he was. Amen? This reminds us, reminds me of people in the world today. That we cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, when things are going good. But when things seem to get off track, when God doesn't perform the way we think He ought to perform, we say, we don't want to have anything to do with Him. Crucify Him. Take Him away from us. Because He didn't do what we wanted Him to do. He wasn't what we thought. This Christian thing, this, it really wasn't what we thought it was. I know people, you know people. They come in, they get committed to Christ. Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks later, they don't know who Christ is. They don't know where, they don't know what happened. They put him on a shelf somewhere. They crucified him. Matthew 27, verse 11, says this. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Verse 15 says, And now at the feast of the governor, it was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Now that's a question. Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. And verse 20 says, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes, and they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The Pharisees of the time had a lot of power, and they persuaded people to say, We don't want this Jesus. You know, I think the reason that a lot of people don't want Jesus today is because there's going to have to be a change in their life. There's going to have to be some realigning of some things. There's going to have to be some dropping of some, some habits, some dropping of some friends. There's going to have to be a shift. And we're okay with where we're at. We really don't care about the crucified, resurrected Jesus if it's going to mean we've got to change some things. And I know that's in an unfortunate, we're uh, in an unfortunate situation, but that's how the Christian worldview is of God. And I said Christian worldview. There's more things on Christian college campuses now that are against God than they are for God. And that's because we've lost the true meaning of resurrection. What does the resurrection mean to you? What do you do? What will you do with this Jesus? You can look at people's life and find out what they're doing with them. Now, they may, what they're doing with him, they may tell you a lot of things because everybody's got a story. Everybody's got their song and dance. But look at their life and find out what are they doing with Christ. Twenty-seven, verse 20, uh, Matthew 27, verse 21 says this. And the governor answered and said to them, Which... Of the two, do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Now see, even Pilate, when Jesus was on trial, and if you call that a trial, and Barabbas was being handed over, even Pilate didn't know what to do with Jesus. Pilate had to ask the question, What do you want me to do with this guy? I ask you again this morning, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Christ? Are you going to live your life hoping that you've got your ticket bought, that when you get to the end of life, because obviously we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday, that when you get to the end of life, that praise God, you've got your ticket bought, you've got it stamped by the blood of Jesus? Is that what you're living for? Is that, is that the climactic... Uh, Position that you're taking? Is that where it's at with you? What are you doing with Christ while you're living? If I, took a, if I asked some of you in this room, I'd say, well, do you remember where you were at before Christ? And man, I could, I could see some of your faces and they would be like, oh man, yeah. I remember where I was at. 
And there would probably be a countenance change of, of maybe not smiles and maybe a little bit of a head hanging. Then I could ask you the question, but what has Christ done for you since then? Your smile would come on you. You'd perk up. You'd, you'd say, oh man, let me tell you what he's done for me. Which would lead me to my question. What have you done with Christ? Since you know this marvelous and you've had this marvelous experience with Christ. With the resurrected King. And you see the transformation and the change in your life. What are you doing with Christ? Will you leave here and never mention His name till next Sunday? Will you run across people that need to know this resurrected King? And say nothing? What are you doing with Christ? Is He something you say, oh, He lives in my heart. Sure He does. My God, let Him out. There's other people who want, to, want Him to live in His heart. Their hearts. If you keep Him in, they're not going to experience Him. It's up to you and I. What are you going to do with Christ? What will you do with Christ? I'll read verse 22 again. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified. I, I don't, you know, when I was reading this, I really didn't grasp. I said, Well, they're exchanging a, a robber for, for, for another person, one man for another. But as a Christian, we see it much differently. We see that the word Barabbas, if you do a, a word study, Barabbas really means lifeless things. So what, what's really happened? The multitude of that time, the Jews said, you know what? I want to trade a, a lifeless thing or something that has life for a lifeless thing. How many people do you know walking around? How many you know that trade life for lifeless things? You know what lifeless things are? Lifeless things are when you put your hope in the world, when you put your hope in everything but God, that's lifeless. Those things will soon fade away. They'll perish. You can't take them with you. When you leave here, it's your soul. What are you going to do with Christ? What's your neighbor going to do? Because they know you have Christ. Christ. Will they die and go to hell because you never went across the street, stepped across the street? Will, will, they, will they live a lifeless life because you never went over across the street, across the yard? It's no problem for us to go over and borrow a cup of sugar. We don't do that anymore. That's old school, isn't it? I know one thing. If Miss Mary lived next to me, I'd go borrow stuff. I'd go borrow. I wouldn't. I would say, Miss Mary, you know, I, I want a cup of sugar. But did you have any cake? <laughs> and I definitely would. If Holly Bond lived next to me, I would definitely go and say, Do you have any cheesecake made? We have no problem going and asking for things and talking about things that satisfy the flesh. But when it comes to spiritual things, we think, Well, I'm, I'm just not qualified. Jesus qualified you on the cross. Jesus made it possible. Matter of fact, the reason that he hung on the cross was so that you and I could be saved, so that you and I would go tell somebody about him. Our churches are empty today. On Resurrection Sunday, we have empty pews here, empty seats. They're empty today because somewhere, Somebody was not excited about their experience with Christ. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? If, if you go to the movies and you watch a good movie, or you go to a good restaurant and you say, oh man, that was good food. You're blasting it on Facebook. You're taking pictures and shooting it out over everywhere before you ever leave the restaurant. How good? Oh, this is good, taking pictures of your food. It's good stuff. Well, I don't know how good it is. Got a good picture. It's like I was reminded of a story once. Went to this restaurant. Guy had the menu out. He ordered something. Man, he had a picture. Man, it looked so good. He said, I'll have that. 
The waitress said, oh, yeah, okay. So she, here in a minute, they brought the food out, man, and he ate that, and she came back a little bit and said, how was the food? He said, well, just give my compliments to the photographer. You have a good experience, you'll tell people. If you had a bad experience, you'll tell people. I hear it all the time, see it all the time. But I never hear people talking about their great experience with Christ. I had a great experience with Christ. I I get to tell it every Sunday. Amen? You say, well, I'm not a preacher. Well, you can be. You don't, have to, you don't have to actually hold the title of a pastor to tell someone about Jesus. As a, matter of, as a matter of fact, if you're waiting for that, you're missing the opportunity. You're missing the boat. My, my. Can somebody just take these two things on the end of your arms and put them together and clap and say, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Do something. Matthew 27, verse 27. Through about 35, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into into the judgment hall and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe upon him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Verse 30, Then they spat upon him, and they took a... And they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon, by, the name, by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. I want you to know something about that real quick. This is a unique thing that I found out. It has not a whole lot to do with the message, but I want you to know it's very interesting. This guy probably, if you look at the countries and where it was situated, probably lived some seven to 900 miles from there. He was going there to celebrate this, this feast. And he shows up there. He didn't, he didn't really know who Christ was. It's not like you have Facebook, you know, back then. The, the word didn't get around real quick. And so he was there celebrating, but he got put in a unique position. And theologians tell us that his sons, um, uh, Alexander and Rufus, probably are the ones later on where Paul spoke about Rufus and Alexander and became great apostles for Christ. That's just a, just a side note that I thought you might want to know there. It it's, uh, gets good stuff, amen. Verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So here's the story. He stood before Pilate. He was arraigned. He was judged. He was sent to a judgment place. He was sent to, a, to a, what they call the judgment hall. And he was beaten. He was beaten. He was spit upon. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. They used this, this whip called the cat of nine tails. That on the very end of this whip, it was one strand of leather. And on that, out of that came nine little, little, little tails. And in that was glass and rock and steel woven in that. Uh, the best depiction, uh, which still comes short, is if you've ever seen the Passion of Christ. And there's one scene on there where, he, where that Roman soldier takes that whip and he comes across and it catches Christ on the side. And when they yanked that out, that was designed to pull flesh and, and meat and muscle away from the bones. And he, he took 39 stripes for you and I for our healing. This is on his way to Calvary. He did so much more than just die on a cross. There's 39 known categories of diseases that doctors say every disease, every sickness will fall into 39 categories. One of the 39. And Jesus took 39 straps. So whatever you're faced with, it's already been covered by the blood of Jesus. Whatever you're going through, Christ has already paid the price for your healing. After they had beaten him unrecognizably. After they had done everything 
unimaginable to a person. They put a cross, made him carry his cross. That's where Simon of Cyrene comes in. They put a cross upon his back. History tells us that the crosses that were made of that time weighed approximately 300 pounds. Now 300 pounds, I'd have to have a Brandon to help me carry that. 300 pounds after I've been, after you've been beaten. After he was beaten, flesh and bone was exposed. He carried his own cross. Oh, but friend, he didn't carry just his own cross. He carried your cross. See, weighted upon his back. Was it because he sinned because he lived a sinless life? Weighted upon his back was every sin that would ever be committed. Laid upon a sinless man's body. Christ didn't come to die for your sins, friend. He came to die for you. He came for you. Sin is what keeps us separated from God. So upon that cross, your sin was laid. In agony, he went to a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. It's where they crucified and killed so many people. They put him on a cross, nailed his hands and his feet to a cross. And there he died. For you, for me, For your kids, for your grandkids, for your mother, for your father, your aunts, your uncles, anyone who does not know him, he died there on the cross. Why did he do that? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. He looked down through the period of the time. And said, Marty's going to need saving grace. I'm going to do it for him. Even though there's going to be a period in his life, he's going to be raised in church. He's going to know about me, but he's not going to do anything with me. He's just going to put me on the shelf somewhere. But I know he's coming to me. I know that one day he's going he's gonna to turn and I want to be ready when he does. And I, so I want to do this for him. I wanna, he wants to do it. He did it for you. He did it for me. Because he loves us. Why is the resurrection so important? Because apart from it, your greatest hope is eternal damnation in hell. Your greatest hope is apart from His presence. And there's no hope there at all. It's empty. You realize that Christ didn't need the resurrection. He was already in heaven. All of this that you talk about, all that we talk about, all of the stuff you see on media and Facebook and all about Easter and all about resurrection was not for Jesus Christ. He did it not for His glory. He did it for you. He did it because He knew you was you were a sinner. He, he knew that I was a sinner. He did it for me and He did it for you. He left the splendor of heaven. Became a mere man through a virgin birth. Walked on this earth. He walked on this earth. And he did not sin. Because see, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, had to be without spot and without blemish. And the Bible tells us that sin creates spots and blemishes upon us. And he had to walk through this life without sin. And because of that, he was the sacrificial lamb. He earned the right 
to be the resurrected king. He earned the right, listen to me, he earned the right to die on a cross. He earned the right to be slain. Because he was sinless. What are you going to do with Christ? What are you... What are you doing with Christ in your life? You know what He's done for you, right? You know that His mother looked on Him and watched Him die in agony, right? You know that, don't you? You know that He gave up everything for you. Matthew 27 verse 45 says this, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a a reed and offered it to him to drink. And The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up the spirit, up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top. Now this is significant. From the top to the bottom. And the earthquake and the rocks were split. In Old Testament times there was a veil between the inner court and the Holy of Holies. Man couldn't pass through that except by priests once a year. The symbolism in the ripping of the veil from the top to the bottom because everything must come from the top. Everything flows downhill. And so when it was ripped from the top to the bottom when he gave up the ghost, what that signified that he was the sacrificial lamb and because he gave his life for you when that veil was ripped and torn that opened and granted access to you and I to enter in boldly into a throne room with grace and mercy provided by Jesus Christ it's a veil that you and I no longer have to hide behind as a matter of fact the Old Testament refers to it in the New Testament as a prophecy it says take the veil off of your hearts remove the veil from your hearts Christ has already removed the veil so that we can come into His presence and we can be forgiven of, of sin but so many of us walk around with a veil on our heart We walk around with a veil still on our heart. And Jesus says, why? 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 I've done all of this for you. Why do you walk around defeated? Why do you walk around with condemnation? Why do you walk around in depression? Why do you walk around thinking and listening to the devil saying you're not saved you can be saved you may not be saved if you haven't asked him into your heart into your life and believed it with your heart you're not saved friend did you hear me you're not saved you can come to church but that that don't that don't get you saved you can be on the church membership roll but you're not saved if you haven't asked him into your heart if you haven't said God I accept you and I relinquish all of my will to you you're not saved we think man if I can just muster up enough enough bravery 
to just tell someone I'm a Christian that I'm in the door. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this morning. No, I'm not sorry to tell you because if I don't tell you, you're going to go to hell. But if I tell you, maybe you'll change the way you're thinking and say, I need this Jesus in my heart. Because you need Him in your heart. You may think, well, everything's going good. Everything's fine in my life, preacher. Everything's going good. Everything's just fine. Well, maybe it is. One day you're going to need Him. One day, you're going to need Him more than your last breath. Just so you know, He gives you your breath. Amen. Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to draw, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. My God, I like that. When I read that, I thought, my God. You know, these kids, when they do something good, they may not do it now because I'm old-fashioned, but they do something good, they cross the arm. I can just imagine an angel rolling back the stone, just sitting on saying, yeah. Yeah, he's not here. He's out of here. He's not here. That just shows arrogance, doesn't it? Well, Jesus can be arrogant. Because he's done all of this for you and I. Amen. Woo. His countenance was like lightning. His clothes was as white as snow. And, and the guards shook for fear of him. And became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. See, I like that. I know you're seeking Jesus who was crucified. He leaves them hanging just a minute. Next verse. Oh, he's not here. He used to have a friend call him on the phone and his dad would answer kind of a snooty kind of fella say hello is Bill there yeah well can I speak to him please yeah it's kind of like what a vision right here I know you come looking for the crucified one stop well he ain't here See, he's left. Why? That's part of the plan. The Bible says he's not here, for he is risen. He's not there. He's he's risen. First Corinthians 15 says that he is the first fruits of the resurrected. Whoo! It gets me excited. If y'all were a little more excited, I might take a lap around the church. I'm so excited in my spirit. Man, this is exciting. He's not there. He is risen. And as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Come see where he was. See, the New English translation says, come and see where he was laying. Oh, Oh, see, I don't think you're getting it like I'm getting it. He's not there. He was there, but he's not anymore. He had to go through the grave to accomplish what God wanted him to. To accomplish salvation for you and I. But he's not there. He's gone. Praise the Lord. My Lord, so what are you going to do with Christ? Despite what the worldview is of Jesus Christ, He is the only, hear me out, He is the only way to heaven. There's not many roads. There may be many roads that you think you're getting on that lead you there, and they may be going in that direction. But when you get there, the bridge is out. You can't get there except through Jesus Christ. 
He has proven that He is the way and the truth and the life. He is that way. John 14 and 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Why is the resurrection so important to the sinner that's not here this morning, to your neighbor that may not know him? It's because that's the only way they're going to get to heaven. There's no other way, church. Jesus paid a price for you and me. Did you hear me? He paid a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says this, For you were bought at a price. What do you think it cost Jesus for you? What do you think you're worth? Million dollars, you know, we fill out financial statements. Take your debts or your assets and your debts. You minus those two and you'll come up with a net worth. That's what the world thinks you're worth. A lot of us think we're worth more than we are. I'd like to take some people, buy them for what they're really worth, sell them for what they think they're worth. What is it to you? How much do you think you're worth? You may be sitting and say, I don't, I don't feel like I'm worth hardly anything. Well, I want you to know that Jesus Christ thought you were worth His life. He thought you were worth everything He had. You say, well, I, I think I'm worth a lot to the kingdom. Well, what are you going to do with Jesus then? What are you doing with Jesus then? Is your, row few, is your row filled up with visions that you had come today? Are all your neighbors saved? Are all your family members saved? Come on. It's good preaching now. What do you think you're worth to Christ? You're worth everything. You're worth everything, church. You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, if you were to purchase something, if I go to, to, the, to the store or somewhere to get something, go to Lowe's, and I want to purchase a, a tool, and I pay the price that's stated on the little sticker. Now, we ain't got any problem getting under charge for something, boy. We're, ooh, they under charge me. Gee, glory to God. Woo! Woo! God's good to me. Do a little dance in the load parking lot. Woo! Save $3. Lord sent take it back. No! Oh, get thee behind me, Satan. My Lord, what kind of business are you running here? Uh, it was a simple mistake. Yeah, but you overcharged me. Why are you like that? Because you want what you paid for. You want what you paid for. Jesus wants what he's paid for. He wants you. He wants your neighbors. He wants your co-workers. He wants you. Where's my youth? Right here, some of you. He wants people in your school. That's what he wants. He wants your peers. He wants the captain of the football team. He wants the captain of the cheerleading squad. He wants the band director. He wants them all. By the way, I'm working on your band director too. He lives next to me. Glory to God. He wants what he's paid for. Don't ever think that he doesn't want you. Don't ever think that somebody is such a, a vile person that he doesn't want them. He does. 
He paid for them already. He wants his merchandise. Why don't we help him carry it out? Why don't we help him? We ain't carrying it to the car. Why don't we help him carry his merchandise to heaven? Because one day we're all going to stand before him. I mean, that's better than what you're amen and Glory to God. I'm going to close, honey. Will you come up here? I know this is a shocker. It's about 20 after 11. Easter Sunday. They gave it to me early. I'm not finished yet. I'm just saying it's early. We'll try to get out by 12. Matthew 28, 17 says this. And when they saw him. Now this is the disciples. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. You go back and read this. It's talking about the disciples that they hadn't seen him just yet. But when they saw him, some doubted. You know, doubting Thomas, right? I don't know about that really. Some doubted. That's why the church house is empty, Patricia. It's because people are doubting that what they see in us is really real. What they see in us and what we experience and what we try to tell them really happened. They, they doubt it. Why is that? Because they see us trying to act so much like the world. They can't tell us any different between the world and, the, and Christ. And we've been programmed as church. You go to church growth, and I've never been to one. Probably should go to one, but I've never been to one. But you know what they tell us, what, they, what I hear from those? Be like the world. Gotta, you got to be like them. Got to get in and mingle with them. I'm thinking, my God, did you forget to read the Bible? Did you skip over and says, where the Bible says, come ye out and be separate? You are a peculiar people. You're not supposed to be like them. I'm not saying you're, you're not supposed to shun them, but you're not supposed to be like them. If everybody's like me, we're in sad state. I've got a couple of good things going in my life. One is I don't have a bad hair day. And the rest of you men can't be married to my wife. She's good. Jesus came and spoke to them. <clears throat> Saying all authority. Are you listening to this? All authority. Not if you think it's um, a small problem. All authority. Not, not if you think it, it, you know, this is beyond you, God. Hello, it's a miracle in itself that you have salvation available to you. I mean, think about it. Have you ever been to heaven? No. Christ, a spirit, came from an eternal heaven to earth. Well, that's a miracle right there. Then this mama was a teenage virgin. What? Well, that's another miracle right there. <laughs> and he walked a sinless life. He's got me beat. Died on a cross. Went back to heaven. Craziest story you've ever heard in your life. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. You ever told somebody something, a miracle that's happened to you? That's the craziest thing you've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It can only happen through Christ. He says, I have all authority. I'm not lacking any authority. That's why this Christian life is more than just salvation at the end. That's already been accomplished. The moment you said, Lord, come into my life, I want to make you Lord and Savior. Boom. That's done. But he says, I have all authority. You need authority to walk through life. He says, I have all authority. Has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know, Whatever my daddy's got. I can call him and say, Dad, can I borrow this or can I have that? He's got the authority to say, yes, you can. You know, when you need something in your life, if you go to your daddy, 
that's got all authority in heaven and on earth. Because that's where we're currently, our current address is here on earth, right? He's got all authority. You need something? Go to daddy. And say, I need whatever it is you need. You do it for salvation, don't you? Why can't you do it for other things? All authority has been given him. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Back to my question. What are you doing with Christ? What are you doing with Christ? Up in the balcony, what are you doing with Christ? He said, oh my Lord, he recognized me in the balcony today. I got to practice getting my eyes up. I'm sorry that you've been looking at this, but I'm... What are you doing with Christ? The Bible says go and make disciples. What does it say? Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. You know that nations can be translated to anybody. Skin color does not matter to Christ. Are you hearing me? I don't know where we got our theology. White, black, red, Hispanic, Asian. Where did that come from? Jesus, uh, uh, newsflash, Jesus is just not an American Jesus. disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then he says, Amen. That seals the deal. It's a done deal. So with everybody standing across this building, my question, what are you doing with Christ? On this resurrection morning, what are you doing with Christ? What are you going to do with Him when you leave this building? You say, well, you know, I would probably have done a lot more, but, the, you know, the message just wasn't that good. The worship just wasn't that good. Oh, I'm sorry, you came for the wrong reason anyway. Amen? If you come looking for what I can give you, you're going to come up short every time you walk in the doors and you're going to be disappointed every time you leave. But if you come asking the question, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with Jesus when I leave here? What are you going to do with Jesus when you leave here? You've been bought with that price. You're His. He died. He was crucified. He died. And he rose the third day. Is my microphone on? Can... I said he was crucified. He died. And rose the third day. There we go. I thought there for a minute that my mic cut off right after that he was crucified and yet I didn't hear the risen part so I want to make sure you got it all. He's a risen Savior. He's a risen Savior, church. He died for you. He took your sin upon him. With every head bowed and every eye closed across this room and in this balcony.